Hi, good morning, everybody. Sound okay? All righty. So, my name is Susan, and I am a student of Lama Jimpa Rinpoche's. And without him and his wisdom and skillful means, this whole place wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. And I am so grateful for having had his guidance and his love throughout all these years. So, this today's talk is about something called the Anapanasati Sutta. That's um, the Pali for the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutra, or um, as Thich Nhat Hanh has translated it, the Sutra on the Full Awareness of Breathing. So about a year ago, I started getting interested in what's known as the Pali Canon. And what this is, is this is a vast body of work um, that is purported to be the exact words of the Buddha. This is what the Buddha said 26, 2700 years ago. Um, and he taught for over 40 years. So you can imagine that this is a lot of teachings that have been passed down over the centuries. His talks were memorized and passed down from monk to monk, and presumably from nun to nun, and layperson to layperson, over about 500 years, when the Buddha was teaching um, written language, according to Wikipedia, um, writ written language was just getting started in India, so there wasn't a lot of literacy, and there certainly wasn't anything like books, and there wasn't reading. So, Everything was passed down orally, and then about the beginning of the Common Era, um, the words were put into written form, and the language that they uh, that was developed to write down um, all of these teachings was Pali. Um, one of the classes I took said that the Buddha did not speak Pali. Um, it may not have even existed when the Buddha was around, but he probably would have understood it um, if it had been spoken to him. But in any case, this oral tradition, by the way, again, according to some of the classes I took, still lives on um, in Sri Lanka and probably also in Burma. Um, monks are still, and nuns are still memorizing the Pali Canon and being tested on it and passing it down orally. So this is a tradition that has been around for a long, long time. Um, and the reason I got interested in the Pali Canon was, you know, all of the reading that we've done, that I've done, and I'm sure you've done as well, it says, the Buddha said, da 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 da. And I'm going, really? So what did the Buddha really say? What's the source? Where'd that come from? And the Pali Canon is the source, that's where it came from. So um, what I'm going to talk about is a very short, very foundational sutra um, called the Mindfulness of Breathing or the Full Awareness of Breathing Sutra. Um, again, it's going to be sutta, S-U-T-T-A, which is Pali. Um, in Sanskrit, which is what we usually use, sutra, S-U-T-R-A. The two languages are really, really similar. Um, so I'll use those. You know, if you hear sutta or sutra, they're the same thing. Um, I don't really know a lot about very many of these sutras. I've taken a few classes. I'm just sort of dipping my toes in it and um, getting to know them. This one is very short, very foundational. Anybody, uh, and that's going to be probably everybody in here who's had some meditation instruction, is going to recognize this sutra. This is one of the very foundational um, talks that the Buddha gave on meditation. So this talk is actually a little bit about meditation um, and the experiences that we might be able to glean from these, these instructions that are in this sutra. So there's going to be some, a little, in a little while, there's going to be some experiential um, things I'm going to ask you to participate in if you want to. Um, and I have a, excuse me, a throat lunge stuck. <laughs> there we go. Um, I've got allergies and my voice just goes crazy if I don't keep something going in it. So, um, 
when I was talking to Lama and asking him if this was like an acceptable topic for a Sunday talk, he said, sure, let's invite the whole family. And what he meant by that is this is part of the Theravadan tradition, um, the insight meditation society as we know it in the West. Um, the Pali Canon is the basis for the Theravadan teachings and the Theravadan studies. Um, you probably know this tradition. Uh, they have a very famous um, retreat center in Marin County called Spirit Rock, which you've probably heard of. Um, and the three founders back in the 70s are Jack Cornfield, Sharon Salzberg, and Joseph Goldstein. So some of you have probably read some or all of them. Um, the, uh, when we were talking about doing this talk, um, I just mentioned, you know, I'm not really sure why I'm so drawn to these because they really are kind of fun to read. And Lama said it's because I, like most people, like a good story. And many of these are stories. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and an end. And primarily, there's characters. There's this vast number of people that the Buddha interacted with and who are part of these talks. That's how we know about uh, Shariputra. That's how we know about Ananda. Um, his son, uh, Rahula, his cousin, Devidatta, all of the lay people and the kings and the princes and the courtesans and all of the peasants is just full of all of these characters. And that's how we know them is from the Pali Canon. So it's really interesting. And the, so that makes it to me anyway, this really living, breathing scriptures, these really living, breathing talks. Um, they're very relatable, very alive. So to sort of set the stage, Dylan, you back there? Hello. Um, uh, to sort of set the stage for the sutra, getting into it, I'm going to show a picture of, or several pictures of a place called Shravasti or Savati. Um, you might know it. Hoopton Children has a very famous monastery in eastern Washington that is named for this place. And it is, um, this is where this sutra was given. This is where the Buddha talked. And so just by way, I picked this photo by way of um, scale because there's a bunch of monks walking around in it. And of course, it's restored. I mean, this is, it was completely ruined, but it's been restored to some degree to give you some idea of what it looked like. So there's one shot of it. This is very cool. This is said to be the place where the Buddha actually sat and talked. It is covered with gold leaf. All in these, these uh, uh, historical pilgrimage sites, there's gold leaf on everything. And um, there's those, you can't see them, but there's also a lot of rubbings from uh, marigolds. Uh, there's marigolds everywhere in India, and so they rub, and it gives us this, this gold sheen. So, I mean, that's what, where they say the Buddha actually sat and taught. So that may be where this sutra was delivered, which I think is like really cool. Okay, one more shot. So this is kind of a panorama of what it looks like, what part of it looks like. It's very big. Um, yeah, thank you, Dylan. That's great. Again, there's a, yeah, nice job. Thanks. So these were all buildings, right? And then a big open areas. So anyway, that kind of sets the stage for where this sutra was, was given. So to get started with the sutra. So um, Thich Nhat Hanh says that there was, this was right after the rainy season. There was a three, there, there was always a three month retreat during the, the rainy season and they did many of the retreats at this location. Um, so there was probably, according to Thich Nhat Hanh, at least 400 monks there. Um, and there could have been, since it was post rainy season, uh, maybe as many as a thousand people there. So monks, and I'm presumably there were a lot of lay people there as well. So as you can see, it was really big. 
and they could easily hold a thousand people. So there, you know, a lot of lot of folks there. And um, this sutra is divided into five parts. So the first part is the introductory part, and he always starts them out as O oh, bhikkhus. Well, bhikkhus is Pali for monks. Uh, bhikkhunis is for nuns. And Joseph Goldstein, when he teaches, he always says that when we read or hear bhikkhus, what the Buddha really means, at least according to Goldstein, is that us, he's talking to all of us, he's talking to anybody who's on the path. So when you hear O bhikkhus, the Buddha is talking to us. So this is part of what is said in the first section, the introductory section. The Buddha says, O oh, bhikkhus, our community is pure and good. At its heart, it is without useless and boastful talk, and therefore it deserves to receive offerings and be considered a field of merit. Such a community is rare, and any pilgrim who seeks it, no matter how far he or she must travel, will find it worthy. Now, that must have felt pretty good to the folks sitting out there. And just to kind of bring that home and bring it into, this, one of the reasons that I find these sutras so kind of c compelling, Saturday, not yesterday, but the previous Saturday, we had a uh, Sangha meeting, and I don't know who was, uh, if any of you folks were there, but Lama Jipur Rinpoche was talking, and part of his talk, at the beginning of his talk, he said almost exactly the same words, right? He was talking to the people that were sitting out here. And he said, you know, this community, in so many words, is rare. It is a field of merit. It is worthy of offerings. And anyone who wants to be a part of this community, who seeks support, who seeks friendship, no matter how far you have to travel, how difficult it is, it's worth it you're gonna find a refuge here. You're gonna find refuge and support here. So what, I mean, I had just gotten started working on this talk, and so I come to this meeting and here's my Lama saying exactly the same thing that the Buddha said 2,600 years ago. Now that was really cool. I mean, that was so evocative of the strength of this tradition of the importance and the strength of the Buddha's words that is just passed down and passed down. And I just heard it a week ago. It was amazing. Um, okay. The other thing that I really like about these, these, these sutras is they are really direct. They're very heartfelt. They're very personal, and they're just, you know, they're just very direct. There's no wishy-washy stuff in here at all. They just write to it. Um, and they're simply, you know, they're seemingly quite simple. But as we all know, that's pretty deceptive. So, as I said, this sutra is divided into five sections. Um, it's actually quite short. Um, some of them are very, very, very long. Um, I'm going to read a piece of the first section, which kind of sets the scene. Um, or I just read a piece of this first section, which sets the scene. Um, and we heard this also in the Heart Sutra, right? Um, it describes the place. This was, it, I didn't read that, but it was at Sarvashti. Um, it describes the time, which is right after the rainy season. And it tells us who's present. So just the same as what we just read in the Heart Sutra. This is very traditional at the beginning of all of these sutras. So I'm going to read um, the second part, and I'm hoping to make this part kind of experiential. So um, if you want to participate, I'm going to ask you to just sort of sit and listen with your eyes closed or open with sort of a unfocused gaze, and just follow the instructions. So he's going to start by um, telling 
us to go to the forest or to the foot of the tree or to any deserted place. Well, like, we're not going to be able to do that. So basically, go to your quiet place, right? Um, just, and then he's going to say to sit stably in the lotus position. Well, since this is the mindfulness of breathing sutra, um, just sit upright as best you can so that the breath can move easily. That's basically the instructions. So I'm going to read this, and then we're going to sit for just a couple of minutes to see if you've got any kind of experience with this. Okay. What is the way to develop and practice continuously the method of full awareness of breathing so that the practice will be rewarding and offer great benefit. It is like this. The practitioner goes into the forest or to the foot of a tree or to any deserted place, sits stably in the lotus position, holding his or her body quite straight and practices like this. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in. Breathing out, I know, I am breathing out. Breathing in a long breath, I know, I am breathing in a long breath. Breathing out a long breath, I know, I am breathing out a long breath. Breathing in a short breath, I know, I am breathing in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath. I know I am breathing out a short breath. Breathing in, I am aware of my whole body. Breathing out, I am aware of my whole body. He or she practices like this. Breathing in, I calm my whole body. Breathing out, I calm my whole body. He or she practices like this. So, like, what could be more natural? I mean, we're just breathing and noticing our body. There's nothing forced. Do you hear anything forced? Do you hear anything striving? Like, is there any goal? No. It's just natural, just sitting there. And my reaction is, 
What a relief. Just following those instructions. Anybody got any thoughts? What did you feel? Just following those instructions. Okay, wait a minute. We're gonna wait, wait, wait. we gotta do this. Sorry. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Um I've been focusing well. I'm wondering, is this going to be a continuation to the 16 breathing exercises? No. Cause, okay. No, I'm not so going to do all it, 16. Right, but it's <laughs> the first four, right? Well, um, we'll go a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, what we just did is the first four. Yeah. Um, and so it's uh, something that I've been practicing at home for the last couple of weeks when I meditate and trying to memorize all of them. <laughs> Um, so I'm really happy that you're sharing this with us today. Oh, it's, good. Um, it's a bit of synchronicity. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. That's all. Uh, I'm struck by the difference between the instruction, like the actual thought, like, oh, I'm aware of my breath, my in-breath. I'm aware of my out-breath and the actual experience of it. Like there, it's like, I can hear you reading it, right? And then there's like a, almost like an echo, you know, in the sense that I, I'm saying it verbally inside, right? Like I'm thinking it, but then there's this sort of ineffable direct experience of just that simple act of breathing in and out. And they're not the same thing, right? The words, the instructions, the thoughts are not the same thing as the actual direct experience. Right. right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Anybody else? Okay. And that leads us to the next couple of instructions, and that's as far as I'm going to go. As um, uh, Susan just mentioned, there are 16 instructions, and um, it it gets into some very um, detailed Theravadan practices, and I don't really know enough about these practices to really speak to them, um, but these first six I can work with. Um, okay, so we're not going to meditate on these, but I want you to just listen to them. So we've sat and we've followed our breathing and noticed, is it long, is it short, is it deep, is it shallow, is it ragged, whatever the breath is. We become aware of our body and we've calmed our body to whatever extent is possible at this particular time. And then the instructions say, breathing in, I feel joyful. Breathing out, I feel joyful. He or she practices like this. Breathing in, I feel happy. Breathing out, I feel happy. He or she practices like this. So what Thich Nhat Hanh says in his commentary is as a result of conscious breathing, and calming the body, which is steps one through four, joy, a pleasant feeling, arises. In the sixth exercise, joy is transformed into peace and happiness, and we are fully aware of it. So, you know, I'm thinking as I'm reading this, there's a thousand people sitting in front of the Buddha 26, 2700 years ago. And they're hearing these words and they're hearing these instructions and they're feeling and noticing exactly the same thing that we're feeling and noticing. And again, so there's this tremendous connection to the heritage, to the lineage, to the tradition that has been going on for so, so, so many years. And so purely, so purely transmitted to us today. So we've got a connection to, you know, these people of so many, so many years ago, many of whom we know, we know their names. We know something about the background by reading these sutras. 
anyway, as Susan mentioned, I've also been working with just these few, just these first few instructions um, while preparing for this talk for the last couple of weeks. And it's true, if you just follow the instructions, or for me, if I just follow the instructions, there is a calmness that sets in, sort of a sense of stillness of, um, and an awareness um, of my body and sort of feeling some knots untie a little bit, something like that. And again, it's just what could be more natural. You know, it's just it's sort of a healing process maybe even. Um, I just sort of breathe a sigh of relief and go, you know what, I am so glad that I know a little bit about how to do this. I am so, so happy that I have this practice. And so there it is, right? You do it, and there's joy, and there's happiness. Um, one description of joy that I read um, is joyfulness means there's no fear, no tension, no ought to. There isn't anything we have to do. There is just this. It's kind of a receptivity, maybe. We're just sitting and opening and just receiving. Um, there's no fighting anything. There's no striving for anything. There's just this. So... Anyway, that's why I got interested in reading the Pali Canon, is there is um, this tremendous depth of tradition and, um, you know, had, being able to find a commentary is very, very helpful. Um, again, there's, there's, you know, all of these other instructions that I can't figure them out. That's why I have a teacher. And that's why I have commentaries to read from other great teachers. So that's really all I had to say today, is just to sort of start sharing something um, from is not necessarily our Mahayana tradition, but most certainly it is connected to our tradition. So comments, questions? Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm wondering if you, in the future, might continue with the other exercises? Um, I might. Um, it's getting into a lot of, uh, if I did, I would go to a sutra called the Satipatthana, which um, ha is more detailed, mm -hmm. and there are extensive writings and teachings on it. Um, so it's kind of this one and a little bit expanded, quite a lot expanded, actually. So, um, and we have actually in the past studied the Satipatthana Sutra at Lion's Roar. This was many years ago. Um, but Joseph Goldstream and a monk by the name of Anilio, Anilio, Biko in, uh, Anilio, uh, he's a German monk who practices in Sri Lanka. Um, has a tremendous book on the Satipatthana Sutra that um, would include everything that's in this one um, on how to practice the four foundations of mindfulness. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I thought it was a great talk. And I love the, um, just the breathing. And uh, so I'm kind of like, a little bit delayed on the responding to the I'm um, responding to earlier. Uh -huh. Like um, I I find that practice just strips it down so much and um, kind of forces my mind to slow down and be in the present and stay in my body and so it's very grounding. What is this? Just calming down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it really is, and I I love the the way that you brought that around to telling us about like that connection it makes me feel deeply connected with the people who came before me and with the buddha 
as well, you know, to, to think that I'm doing exactly, you know, this many thousands of years later what was instructed, you know. But also the uh, kind of really just also when I'm breathing, like I can see the other, it's like ripples. Like if you look into a lake and you can see a shadow of something, but you stay on the surface of the lake, but you can see the stuff, the things underneath it kind of moving around. And it, that's how it is with like the thoughts and the feelings and the, the sort of things that we tend to get spun out on. But if you stay with the breathing, you stay with the kind of on that, on that lake surface kind of seeing yeah. that. Yeah, you know, nice metaphor, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jan. Yeah, really nice metaphor. Thank you, Susan. Um, it's a very simple yet profound what you're saying. And I think well, that's, that's kind of like the sutras, right? Yeah, yeah, they're they're real simple, but boy, there's a lot there. So I was just thinking about like when I'm teaching meditation, um, I should just use this. <laughs> I mean, it's so simple. Um, I feel like, you know, that that um, breathe in, feel joy, breathe in and feel joy, and breathe out and feel joy. I mean, um, that's great. Like, it's it's that simple. Like, it's all the other stuff that gets in the way. And uh, Lama used to say a lot, "It's easy." And Buddhism often doesn't feel easy to me. There's some like so much uh, memorization of the the five, the four, the twelve, <laughs> all these different things. But um, I think it's it's reassuring to bring it the brass tacks like that and just be present with the breath. Um, in some ways, it is easy, <laughs> hard and easy at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We strive, right? We 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 got a goal. We got to do it right. There's nothing in here about that. Yeah. I was curious uh, if the sutra mentions anything about um, awareness outside the body. Um, you know, you said at the beginning the teaching is or the the first technique is going sitting under a tree or there's a, a few other things. Um, is there any mention of like being aware of the space or the sounds or you know anything else around you, or is it coming continuing to come back to the breath and continuing to come back to the body and in this focus? in this sutra? Yes, right. And I am sure there are. I mean, I know there are many other sutras. I mentioned the Satipatthana a few minutes ago, which talks about the four foundations of mindfulness. And so that is um, the body, feelings, um, the mind, which is going to include um, objects of mind, and which, and then dharma, they say dharmas, uh, which means everything else. So with the hindrances and you know all these many lists that there are in 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 the Pali Canon. So yeah, not this particular one, but if you again, if you want to look at all of that kind of stuff, the Satipatthana is the way to start. It's called the Four Foundations of Mindfulness Sutra, and it's long, but it's remarkable. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, kind of to piggyback off of what Jen said. Um, thank you for the history of the community back then yeah. um, and how rare and like precious that is. Um, I'm still pretty new to this community, but when you were talking about what Lama said last Saturday, that it makes sense. I've been questioning, like I keep getting drawn back here. It's such a beautiful place. It's very, it is very rare to find these days a community like this. So you know, my outside brain wants to question, like, why is this such an amazing place? You know, keep coming back here. And when you tie it in with history like that, 
it makes sense and it feels really special and connected throughout time. So thank you for that. Yeah. Appreciate your talk today. Thanks. Oh goodness, I might have to say this then. So in 2009, when I first started going to a different Sangha, I was super paranoid about it being not okay. So every time someone said a word or a name of somebody, I would write it down and I would go home and I would research to make sure that was an actual individual. And slowly but surely, I had created my whole timeline from Shakyamuni Buddha all the way forward. So feel good. I am a whole UC Davis trained historian. So there you go. <laughs> That's it then. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. When you said breathe in joy, breathe out joy, then you said another word to breathe in and out. Happiness. <laughs> and what the instructions is breathing in, I feel joy. And then breathing in, I feel happy. And again, what Thich Nhat Hanh says is that um, as a result of, you have to do all the steps. Right, so as a result of doing the breathing and getting into the body and calming the body, then this pleasant feeling arises, which is joy. And then joy is transformed into peace and happiness. And so it's just, it's again, just following the instructions, follow the steps, yeah. Anybody on Zoom? I don't see any hands up. But Ella sent a message. And okay, do you see any hands, Dylan? No, I don't either. Okay. All right. So that's all I've got. And so we will do closing prayers. Thank you all so much. Let's begin. Due to the merits of these victorious actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all power for Chen Rezin Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Sang, magical display of the deep awareness of the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losong Drogpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, Sharda. So are there any announcements? Yeah, big Donna Beach at the word, right? So that's from Andrew speaking on his behalf. Anything else? Hmm? Oh, there we go. Is that better? All right. Did everybody hear about the Donna Beach? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just have one thing to say. The uh, Delic um, service meetings for the three, uh, we are not going to have a meeting in August. We're just kind of running out of time. <laughs> it's just been a busy month and we've got the retreat at the end. Um, so I, that reminds me, anybody who um, has not signed up yet for the Lotus View Retreat, please do so ASAP so that those people who are doing all the planning and such 
Um, we'll be able to have a head count so we can figure out food and all of that kind of stuff. Um, just to follow up on the Delix, however, and I'm looking for the date, sorry. Um, September 14th, which is a Saturday, that will be the next Delic meeting, and we're having a special teacher um, for that meeting, a friend of mine and a friend of Mama Jimpa's, um, a Zen priest from Valley Springs by name of Doralee um, Katona um, will be talking to us. Um, she's got a, a long um, history of Zen practice and of their uh, psychotherapy and teaching and all of that stuff. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about the content um, of a, in a book called How Can I Help? And how to be aware and how to be present with people, um, which is the first requisite for actually being able to help anybody. So that is September 14th will be the next Delic meeting. That's a Saturday. It'll probably be a couple of hours, starting probably around 11 o'clock. Kind of oh, crap, I'm sorry, I went running yesterday. <laughs> um, we have a member who is um, in crisis, and so if you're interested in uh, doing a wellness check today, if you're available to visit somebody who lives near McKinley Park to do just a wellness check and see that she's okay, um, let me know before we, we all depart here. Um, even if it's just one person or a small group of people to just, um, and I can fill you in on the details, uh, she, she knows that I'm speaking on her behalf. Um, but I'm, I'm deeply concerned after a call last night. So thank you. Also, if you um, participated in the sacred gift exchange last week, please see me after uh, today's talk. Omo ara ya pa sa ya na indi Om ara ya pa sa na 